Hi, welcome back to Andalusitano. I'm Sophie Gates. Uh, Andalusitano is the Iberian horse agency that finds Andalusians for your soul. And today I'm talking to David Arguelles Capilla, who is an international equine surgeon. Um, he has worked in uh, over 12 uh, countries in the world, uh, including Europe, uh, America, and the Middle East. Uh, he knows all the different horse breeds and I wanted to talk to him a little bit about uh, just like the, the, the problems with the Spanish horses or, or because I've sent a lot of horses to you to be operated uh, to take away the OCD, the bone chips that mm, some young horses might have. Uh, and I, I was just hoping if we could have a little chat about your experience with all of this because yeah yeah I'm, I'm i'm very happy to be invited to talk about that and yes talking about lusitanos and andalusians especially andalusians we we need to say that ocd is quite a common disease especially it's affecting the fellow and the hawks and uh, what i have to say is that in my experience it's very good to operate them before they are uh, two years old. So when they are young, between one and two years, not before one year old, when they are between one and two years, is, a, is you know, is the best, um, the best time to operate them because then we are uh, removing all the fragments that they are, um, possibly they can do some uh, damage in the joint in the future. And then we also divide the lesions where the cartilage is not, is not okay. So we are, preventing uh, uh, future lesions and we are promoting that the horse will do a, a, a really long um, sports uh, career or press pressure career, whatever. So it's very, very important. I think many people, they don't know that this disease um, is not only um, inherited, but has many other uh, possibilities that are influencing in the pain of the illness like the diet and the exercise control and all that. So when they are very young, uh, especially in the, in, the, in, the, in the farms and wherever they should do uh, like a study, because I know from a friends of mine, they're nutritionists, that they, they may disappear the OCD in many, many uh, stables all over the world, just correcting and changing the way of feeding the animals, okay? Because, yeah. you know, the <clears throat> unbalance between calcium and all that and, and also the high energy is very problematic. Um, so this should be um, keep in mind and, and, and just... I, know, th I think, that, I think um, uh, that's very true. I also think that it's... Um, I might be wrong, but I would like to ask you uh, if it is more common on the horses that are from morphological shows that they try to feed up so that they look much mm, more bulky than they should do at two and three years old. Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's, there's absolutely, it has been proved that, that when the horses are uh, feed high energy to be very tall or very like uh, strong and powerful in a very short time, there's no time for the cartilage and the tendons and the ligaments to, you know, to, to be adapted to the new situation. And also, you know, I think this, the Andalusian horse is a horse that is, um, is really getting mature um, like in five, six years. Mm. So it's, it's also good not to, to start training them before they are maybe four years old. Otherwise, you know, if you, if you have all these situations and, and there's like a, some kind of problem in the joint, we can also make it worse. Mm. So yeah, you're right, absolutely. I mean, high energy, in a short time, especially when they are they are small or they are young, because we want to make them uh, huge uh, and uh, fat or whatever or big. It's it's very bad. It's very very bad. It's against uh, the nature and against that. So I think we should change our mentality, especially in some parts of Spain, not all over Spain, of course. Um, but the horses they, they need the time to grow up, uh, to grow up. Sorry, and they you know, they need the, the proper energy in the right time. We shouldn't uh, keep a very high energy and unbalanced uh, feeding. Otherwise, we can get all these illness and problems in the joint, of course. Yeah. 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 So, um, 
So do you, what you generally should exercise, when, when are the OCDs formed uh, then? When the OCD, the osteochondrosis, the second is one of the, there, there are like five different uh, growing uh, illness in the horse and one is the OCD. And uh, as I said to you, it can appear from the six months up to uh, three or four years. But the thing is that there is a window that uh, between, you know, before one year, some of the lesions can correct themselves by themselves. So we don't need to operate. Otherwise, I mean, of course, if we have a case that is very dramatic with a lot of changes and the horse is very lame or there's a lot of distension, maybe we can operate him before uh, a year old. But mm. normally it's between the one year and two years that they should be operated because after, after one year and a half, two years, if the horse has no, I mean, he's not going to develop new lesions of OCD. So that's the, that's the time to do the screening when they are one, between one year, two years old to do the x-rays and find out if they have the, you know, the fragments of the lesions and then operate or, or do whatever we need to do, okay, to prevent uh, yeah. future lesions in the in the horse, as you do. I mean, when, when you are sending me the horses there, most of them are young, so we, we can, you know, like, uh, otherwise it's too late, or we can I, be too late. I mean, some of of course not, but yeah. I think, uh, I think that's something that comes from the Swedish uh, way, you know. I think in Sweden they're quite good at that. Um, it's very common that they take out the, the OCDs in the horses, almost always. You're right. Yeah. And, and yeah. in Spain, uh, okay, no. In Spain, many times I hear that the vet, they say, oh, well, if it doesn't give any problems, we just leave it. Uh, but do you recommend to take it out? Well, it depends. That's, that's also very important and it's a very good question. I mean, of course, if you, it's not, not all the OCDs are the same and not all the fragments and the, the place where the fragments are placed are the same. But if we are talking about that we want to have a, a future, a very good uh, athletic horse and with a very long sports career, it's better to remove them. But of course, if it's very small or it's like tiny or whatever, or it depends. Of course, we have to, this is why it's very important to do the x-ray and find out how many fragments, the size of the fragment, the position of the fragment, and all that, because it's not the same to have a little fragment in the cochlea of the tibia that to have a very big fragment uh, that is free in the joint, you know? It's absolutely different. And, and as you know, you, may, you have been dealing with horses uh, many, many years. Some of the horses with OCD, they don't have any sign of distension or anything. When they yeah. are, maybe you do a purported exam and they are 12 years old and there's nothing there, so maybe, it's not okay. I mean, it's, it's completely okay not to operate them anymore. You know, some of them, they do right, but depends on the size of the fragment, the position, the number of the fragments, and the, how is the job to do the x-rays. Some, most of them are really distended, you know? You've yeah. seen many of them. They are big, big hawks, whatever. And yeah. also, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. especially if some, someone is, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the southern or in Spain, any Anderson horses are for beauty shows, and if you don't remove these fragments, or so they start to have a little bit of distension, and if you don't do it at the right time, they will never be okay for beauty show. They will always be very distended because the fragment, you know, if, they, if it's free, um, it can go all the time running and, and uh, moving in the joint and do a lot of uh, damage in the cartilage in the synovia and all that, and this will be always chronic swollen and inflammation. Yeah. So that's, you know, always like ugly appearance and they will never be, or will, you know, will not get so many points in their beauty shows. So, and I think, you know, should be all the horses, when you are selling a horse, you know, having this uh, report from a specialist, surgeon, whatever saying, that the joint was fine, that we just remove the fragments in order to prevent uh, future lesions would be great. You know, mm -hmm. this is like a certificate that the horse is absolutely fine. Uh, and it would be, you know, it's something that you do to prevent uh, a lot more lesions in the future. I remember in Belgium when I was working, you know, this program, the horses are, are sent at the university also, at Ghent University to be operated. They have a lot of OCD more on the stifles than, than we have in the Andalusians, but okay. there is a deal that the horse should be castrated at the same time 
uh, because we know it's like it can be inherited, no? So they do okay. all of the yeah. Uh, they do <laughs> both of the. I mean, I'm not saying that this is the right thing to do because, yeah. as I say to people, is not all of them are inherited. Some of them are because nutritional things or exercise or infections or whatever or, or traumas. But of course, I mean, this is a way of um, getting everything under control. So, so why do you think that the, the, those bigger type warm blood horses, like you say in Holland, uh, they have them more in the stifle and like the Spanish yes. more in a different place or? Oh, yeah, <clears throat> the, the Spanish, they have it on the hawks a lot. Also the, Andalu the Lusitanos, I've been more, I've been going to Portugal more than 15 years now. And I've done more than, this is what I do in Portugal. I mean, they, they, they uh, collect the cases. So I go, a, I go a couple of days every two months. So I can operate maybe 10 horses in two days. Most of them are like hemiplegias and, uh, and uh, arthroscopies. Mm. So Lusitanos and Andalusians are very, very alike. They have all the fragments in the pellops and in okay. the, in the hops. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the, and the one plots in, in Holland, Belgium, and also Sweden, all of them, they, they have a lot more in the, in the style forms. Mm. It's amazing. And also, yeah, and in the coffin joint also. And then the Swedish trotters and uh, in Finland also, they had a lot of fragments on the, <coughs> on the plantar area of the fell lock. Like in no, the, in, behind. Oh, behind the plantar, okay. Yeah, it's but very, that's... very typical for the trotters. So, you know, every, every breed, has different locations and and manifestations of the of the illness, no? But as I say to you, you know, Andalusians and Lusitanos, especially hawks and well, you you've seen many of them, no? Yeah, yeah, no. And, I, I I'm asking, I don't know, so I, I might have seen them, but I don't know if it's true. So that's why I'm asking you. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's also like publications saying that that the most common. Uh, place for OCD in Andalusians and Lusitanos is the hawk and the fellow. Yeah. Do you think it's got to do with confirmation, how they're built? Uh, well, I think maybe yes, there is a little bit of, uh, yeah, as I said to you, there's many, many different things and one can be the confirmation of the way they are. And this is something else that we have to say that that I think in my opinion, in my country, we should uh, keep a little bit more of attention in how the Falls and the horses are are being uh, somehow uh, you know like breed and all that. I mean they are doing a great job, but in, I think we should do it a little bit better in a way of uh, having the you know the always the help of the veterinarian, the nutritionist, and also maybe the farrier when they are very young and all that, because a little trauma or a very bad conformation. When they are young, you can correct it very well. Mm. If they are a fall or a filly, but if they are uh, old, then uh, it's too late. And then this can promote also, uh, together with other factors like the nutrition, the heritage, whatever, to have the OCD. So I think all together is very important. Yeah, um, no, I, I think also maybe because I, I, well, I'm sure they're big stud farm, but there's a lot of very big stud farms in Spain. They might have. I don't know, up to 60, 70, 100 uh, foals a year. So I can understand why they uh, might not be able to do 100 x-rays every year of every single horse. So uh, my, one might have to take that into consideration as well. But uh, Yeah, but maybe, maybe, I don't know. I mean, most of them, I mean, as I say to you, many of them, like most of them are doing a great job, but mm. maybe they, they should do like... Um, selection of some of them and do like a trial and see how it goes in the yeah I, don't know. I mean many of them, they are absolutely clean eh? I'm not saying but some of them are they have a lot of problems uh, and saying again just changing the way of feeding and the way of um, growing them and the fairy work and whatever they will absolutely like eliminate maybe 90 percent you know but yeah, that's interesting. Very interesting. Um, so compared to um, like it, it, there's, we've been talking about the Andalusians and the and the Lusitanos. How about uh, say the crossbreeds like a Hispano Arab or or those kind of horses? Are they sounder or have yeah, you know, yeah. 
I think, you know, it's also a matter of uh, when you cross breeds, uh, there is an improvement in all the characteristics of the breed and of the individual. So if you keep, <clears throat> I mean, it's not like that, but, but if you are not, if you are selecting one horse, there is a lot of inbreeding or, you know, and then it's the characters, uh, genetics, they, some of, sometimes they are tricky. So they, they, they go, if you, for example, are selecting for beauty or for confirmation or for any aptitude, maybe if you are focused on that, it would be bad for other things. So this is why if you have a crossbreed like Hispano-Arabs or whatever, they are a little bit stronger in that way because mm -hmm. they don't have so many OCDs on all that because this is like a new blood crossbreed and then you have... Uh, other you know advantages comparing to the pure breed but on the other hand for example the arabs and the and the thoroughbreds i think the thoroughbreds are very mixed so this is why maybe they don't have so many ocd problems <laughs> it's a it's a breed that is absolutely mixed by many other ones and maybe the andalusian and the lusitano they are very very old they are one of the first breeds in the world so yes maybe this is also the yeah mm. that's why Yes. Uh, yeah, but on the other hand, I mean, you know, Andalusians and Lusitano are absolutely one of the breeds most beautiful and more easygoing and uh, wonderful to enjoy because you can trust uh, they are they are really easygoing, most of them. It's, isn't it true? I mean, you know, my, my granddad, he had some of them and we were always, we were always enjoying a lot since we were very, very... Uh, small very young <clears throat> we were <clears throat> riding on them even a stallion and all that it was fantastic because you can trust absolutely you know That's so i think this is why it's so yeah and i was living in uh, in field or sweden or belgium holland many 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 uh, women especially they they enjoyed a lot <laughs> like middle ages like uh, 40 50 years old they love to ride on andalusian horses <laughs> because i think it's yeah I mean, yeah yeah, no, because they're very easy and comfortable. Uh, yeah. Why do you want to compli complicate your life at that age? <laughs> just, just. That's right. Comfortable. And uh, they are trustable, no? They are, they are. I mean, of course. I mean, you cannot generalize, but uh, in my opinion, my experience, also like working with them here in Cordoba, we we never had really few accidents or, or like a difficult things with them because they are very easy to handle and they are absolutely nice. They are nice guys. Yeah. I remember when I was in Belgium, you know, like uh, the BWPM, they are absolutely a <laughs> pain in the ass sometimes um. because they are very, very spoiled and uh, they are very strong and it was very difficult to even, you know, like lameness examination, wherever. I remember we have a special uh, a special like a uh, system to block them with a, a very small needle yeah. that was like doing like a bind. Otherwise, yeah. it was impossible to put a needle there because oh, they were like they knew. And, yeah. oh, they, they knew that you were gonna inject them. No, and they, yeah. They, yeah, they were clever and they were very spoiled and they didn't allow anyone to like uh, you know mess around with them. <laughs> but I think and I don't know why. In my opinion, they are. Absolutely. And also, when I was in England for a while, thoroughbreds, I think they are also good because they have been since very, very young, uh, you know, and trained to be yeah. mm. people and all that. But in my opinion, thoroughbreds can be a little bit unpredictable sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you know. I, um, I yeah. had a lovely thoroughbred when I when I was growing up. I had a, I had a, 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 a horse that came from the racetrack. Uh, yeah. that didn't want to race anymore yeah. and he was yeah. lovely I could do anything with him I mean of course he had a bit of gas when you were riding him yeah. but uh, in every other aspect he was so easy um, I, I don't mind them at all I don't mind the, I love the Hispano Arabs uh, I love the PRE and the Lusitano course um, I don't a pure Arab it's not my thing but that's just my own uh, my own uh, Preference. Well, you know, my, my experience in Qatar is like uh, Arabs are very difficult to handle and to, you know, to make things like goons or, or like deal with them. They are very, very, very unpredictable. Yeah. yeah. Especially they're when they're, yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, because I remember we were working a lot in Qatar in the Riding uh, Equestrian Club. It's a hospital there, big one. So we were doing a lot of surgeries and lames and all that. And with Arabs, it was quite difficult. Yeah, mm -hmm. with Arabs, it's okay. But Arabs... Just to give a little bit more background on on you, um, you're now resident with the University Hosp uh, Equine um, Hospital in Cordoba, uh, yeah. uh, but you are also a resident in the U.S. American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation, right? Um, I'm I'm a I'm a board certified already, like from uh, 2007 equine surgery from the European College and, uh, and I'm about to finish the residency in uh, sports medicine and rehabilitation from the American College. I have to do the exam next year in, in Colorado mm -hmm. and the residency I'm doing is uh, under su supervision of another diplomat. Uh, he's an American diplomat so we, we meet sometimes and he's like uh, somehow supervising my all my program so I had to do publications and, and yeah, I know my that. lameness. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's it. So, so, yeah, so, so basically, I'm, I'm gonna... why you've been working so around the world is because people, you are uh, a, a very good keyhole surgeon. Uh, or is that your speciality and that's why they send you all over the world to, to operate? Well, I think, I think a combination of character, I like to, you know, since I was very young, I like to travel a lot. And I also, if you are a specialist in equine surgery and you are a, a diplomat, then you have the chance to, you know, to travel all over the world. So I've always been very, like, you know, enthusiastic about traveling and knowing uh, new cultures and all that. I've been working for a while in Hong Kong also. I've been in Australia, in South Africa, Canada. Uh, but mainly Europe, and um, you know when, when there was this very bad crisis in 2008 in Spain, then I decided to move to Finland, and Norway and Sweden, and I had my own enterprise with another colleague, my couple, and she was um, Dutch, so we were like uh, running the world, <laughs> with ma making a lot of uh, surgeries everywhere, and also like organizing courses and all that. I don't know. I think it's a kind of, uh, but 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 yeah, you're right. And many of uh, of my colleagues that are also like equine surgeons, diplomats, they have been working in many different places. Um, and it's also difficult, you know, because horses are very difficult as patients. You you need to be very good, and you need to be focused on what you're doing. Uh, you have to put all your energy and and be absolutely super good. Otherwise. They are very bad patients. If you don't know what you're doing, yeah. uh, they, will, they, they will never forgive you. Eh? It's true. So yeah, yeah. But, but now you know I'm 45. So I, I decide, sorry, I decided no, to come sorry. back. No, sorry, no, but I was thinking. But when you're working with them, they're they're asleep, <laughs> or or. or. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah. But what I mean, I'm doing is like you, you need to have a lot of skills. If you do a thoroscopy or laparoscopy, you need to do. I mean. Maybe it seems to be, it seems from outside, it's easy. But of course, I mean, you need a lot of training and you need to be focused and to be good enough not to damage, just to remove what you need to remove. I mean, it's yeah. like everything. Yeah, no, I understand. Happening. It's very precision work. Uh, yeah. And often yeah. a lot of money at stake uh, with, the, with the owner of the horse or the value of the horse. So, so you're a little yeah. bit uh, squeezed maybe. Yeah, well, also is is the car, and I mean, now that I'm 45, I'm a little more relaxed, so I know my job. And of course, I mean, you never has to be relaxed absolutely because things can happen. And as I to you, the horses are sometimes unpredictable as, as patients in a way that many complications can happen because they are uh, they are very sensitive. No, they are very, you know, from uh, complications, infections, and whatever. So you should do everything perfect. Otherwise, uh, complications are coming. Yeah. But what I'm, I'm trying to say is that, you know, we are not a lot of specialists in the world and also doing a residency and, 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 you know, investing such a lot of time, five years of your life, four or five years and all that, then, you know, it's like a way of life. Yeah. And, uh, exactly. uh, in so many we are training and then you have to continue uh, to train, uh, and train 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 and train. Mm. Yeah, I'm not 
And there's many, many surgeons that are not diplomate, whatever, they're good, of course. I'm not saying that, but I mean, being a diplomate means that you have all the residency, the exams, and then you're expertized on that, no? I don't know. It's a way, it's very vocational. You, you, you love it, you know, it's, it's love it or leave it. It's, it's like, it's amazing. And yeah, but of course, I mean, growing up now, 45 years old, I'm, I'm starting to think that may, there are many other things also important in <laughs> Ah, yeah. Not just horses and <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to keep a family perhaps if anybody yeah. if any, any pretty ladies yes. listening <laughs> <laughs> no it's true this is why I decided eligible bachelor <laughs> yeah yeah when I was 40 I decided to come back I was in in Finland I like to be there but the culture is very different as you know and especially Finland is even more different than Sweden. Uh, so I decided to come back. I came back to Cordoba and uh -huh. to Barcelona. And I, I'm very Spanish, so I like, I like to be surrounded by the culture and all that. I don't know. Let's see how, what happens now from now. No? All this horrible crisis is now. I think, uh, it'll, I be think over. It, it'll be over soon. I hope so anyway. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. I really so. hope we, so. We need, we need to be positive. And, and this country is, is beautiful. And, and yeah, well, you know, you've been living here for many years, no? Yeah, I, my parents moved here when I was 12. Oh my so, God, so you're... So I grew <laughs> up in Fuangirola, in, the, in the, um, a, a little town just outside Malaga. I'm not sure you know it, but yeah, you do probably. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, yes, yes. Mm. And, uh, but then I, I went back for my studies. I've been living in England as well for a while. I've been moving a little bit back and forth, but... My mother has uh, been here ever since, so mm, that's why I live here as well. I love it. I feel... Especially, uh, yeah. Especially okay. Malaga, I think it's, it's amazing because it's, it's a very beautiful place with a lot of um, light hours during the day and all that. It's, it's, it's my favorite place in Spain. It's Malaga and Cadiz. I love them. It's, it's true, um, I, I love... Malaga, yeah. Yeah. Cordoba is very cultural, but I, there's something about the sea that makes you... Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. I, was, I was born in Barcelona, so I always miss, the, miss the, the sea. When I was in Helsinki, it was okay. I mean, it was not the Mediterranean, but even though, I mean, it was very good to walk uh, beside, you know, the sea. It was the Baltic Sea, it's not the same, but anyway. It, it was also very nice and you can sail and go to the islands and swim and all that. So mm -hmm. I miss that. Uh, but Malaga is just one hour and one hour and a half from Cordoba. So it's great. <laughs> yeah, it's not that far. Uh, so um, I, I was thinking maybe what shall we talk about something else like um, the rehabilitation after uh, the, an operation or something? Yes. Well, one topic that is uh, coming up now is we are doing a lot of uh, training and, and conferences at Weminar about physiotherapy and rehabilitation and all that, because all over the world um, is now proved that it's very important to rehabilitate horses after they've been like uh, resting for a lesion in a tendon or a joint or whatever. So it's very good, and it's also one thing that I would like to say is that you, you should do, you should always keep in mind with a plan of exercise introducing again, otherwise the lesions can worse. So you always have to have a plan in weeks. Uh, always you have to have the support of a veterinarian, veterinarian physiotherapist, the farrier, and the trainer. You know, all together. Otherwise, um, it can be wrong. And also, you know, the very important thing is that uh, if a horse, for example, is just um, a jumper and has a lesion and has been rehabilitating for a while, in order to introduce again for uh, in jumping, I mean, meanwhile, you should, uh, you know, you should keep him fit, doing uh, all these core exercises that, you know, is, they are very important and also train the horse in another disciplines different from the jumping. Ah, he yeah. should do a little bit of massage, he should do a little bit, because then all, all the muscles and joints and the structures are working and are some, somehow are getting ready again for the jumping. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's not, let's say that it's not good to keep the horse always, even if it's completely fine. It's not good always to 
to do with him the same protocol, same exercise, because then this is why sometimes the lesions are happening, you know, because it's the whole body and you need to work with him. You need to make him uh, exercise all the other joints, all the other movement, because it's not the same uh, jumping horse that uh, the side horse. This is why I'm telling you something. This is why the three eventing horses are having less lesions. It's amazing. Yeah, the jumpers, so with the hard work they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're very fit. They do a lot of different types of works. <coughs> so this is why the joints, the muscles, the ligaments are really fit and they are protecting all the all the areas. So this that's is why a very, very good. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just uh, want to yeah. make sure that we talk about this because it's a very good, uh, it's also good not only for uh, recuperating lesions, but <laughs> when you train any horse, um, to try to vary the, the training and Especially, I think, with the Andalusians that are very weak. I'm, I'm not, sorry, maybe not the right word, but um, they're not as durable. They're not as durable yeah. maybe as other breeds. So they have, they will get lesions easier if you yeah. overwork them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, I agree with you. So the, the the thing would be to prevent all this to happen, and to, in order to make prevention. What I say is that fairy is very good, also physiotherapy is very good, but also a good uh, training plan and exercise plan, changing surfaces of working, okay. changing yeah. way of working, and also working with the horse by feet. I mean, you know, with the ropes. From the ground. The yeah. and, mm -hmm. uh, from the ground, yeah, sorry. It's very, 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 very important. Otherwise, I mean, if you always keep doing the same thing, same thing, that I think this has been done like that many, many years. And now everyone, you know, the specialists and the rehabilitators and all that, they found out also it's, it's coming from, from uh, human athletics. It's the same, you know? Exactly. You're yeah. a specialist in, uh, in athletics, whatever, you should also swim or you should do many other things. Because otherwise, you know, it's, it's a way, the, the body is a whole thing and the horse is a whole thing. So you should make, I remember now, for example, there is um, one, of the, one of the clients, they have a very precise horses, the Spanish ones, but they made them jump a little bit sometimes. Or they, 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 they use these bars to jump over and it's a very good exercise to, to make them jump because all the joints and all the tendons are working at the same time. Yeah. And also like um, reindeers from the round, or many, many exercises, like, like doing a lot of perception, proprioception is also very important. To so, make like some obstacles and, and make them do like S uh, exercises and all that is very, very important. So a combination of everything would be great. So when you, talk about, when you talk about different surfaces, I just want to say uh, one thing that I think is probably not so good, and that is if, it is a too deep um, arena or surface um, uh, that they're going in, like deep sand, is probably not the best to train no, any no, horse in. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, the deep sand is the, the worst thing to also, I mean, the super hard surface. So, so the stream, the side stream size are very bad. Yeah, but the sand, the big sand or the sand, many, <coughs> many arenas can be like that. I mean, we are lucky that now, in Spain, we have a lot of uh, facilities that are more and more improving and, and they are really good. I've been visiting many of them, but you're right. I mean, in, in like not very good ones, the horses can really damage themselves, the tendons and all that, especially if they are not very well shoot or they are not shoot um, regarding the arena or the surface they are working. You are absolutely right. The, the tendons can, you know, they can damage very, very yeah. easily. And also the shoeing uh, is, uh, I think, what I, I'm just talking generally a little bit about this, but because of that, a lot of the Spanish horses are brought up in big uh, herds. If they're from a very big stud, they might not have seen a human between their born until they are two and a half, three years old, because they're living in the wild, which is good in one way, because they, they get the herd mentality and, and they're easier to work with mentally and they, they normally have a very good mind because of it. 
<clears throat> but as you were saying previously, uh, it also uh, uh, does some bad things on the on the conformation of the legs and the tendons and the hooves and how the how their angles are of the legs. Um, <clears throat> and I think a lot of people make a mistake that when they're already too old, uh, they try to correct this. Yeah, um, that's very bad. You're, yeah, yeah, that's um, that's impossible. I mean, it, and you would make them worse and worse. I mean, if they, the conformation is bad, you should try then not to worse it, but just to keep it like this. Otherwise, mm -hmm. if you try to correct it when they are five years, six years old, it's absolutely a big mistake. You're right. Yeah. But as you said, as you said, in Spain, I think now is a little bit better, but it still has to improve. As you say, in many big breeds or whatever breeders, uh, the farrier should go and visit and, and, and you know, take care of the foals and the fillies every, I don't know, every month or every two yeah. months. You mm. know, it would be good. That would be the best. If that would be possible, that would be that would the best. best. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, as you say, it's a money investment. But, uh, but I think it's worth it because if you, if you correct that uh, little mm, confirmation problems in the right time, it would be better in the future, of course. Yeah. yeah. No, so prevent, prevention is, is the solution for everything, you know, for lesions, for uh, confirmation problems and all that. And, and, and talking about, again, about the joints and the OCD, whatever. I mean, as, as soon as you, you know, uh, the better, the, the sooner you, you find there is a fragment or there's a problem there with the X-rays, with the, and the, the sooner you decide to operate them if they are, I mean, if it's indicated, the, be the better. It's, it's like this, you know? Otherwise, maybe it's too late, as you say, with the confirmation things, with the problems in the joint and all that. But I think you yeah. know very well. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's good. nice to hear it, uh, hear it from you as well, and it's good with the information. I'm really pleased that I've been able to, to talk to you and that you wanted to talk to me. Um, sure. We can talk any other day about any other topic if you want. That's all good. right, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about fashion. Nice. Can we do a fashion talk? <laughs> about what? Fashion? <laughs> I don't know anything about well, fashion. <laughs> you said any other subject, so what else? <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, horses, horses. No, but I'm talking about... <laughs> I don't know. Like, like, uh, I, well, I, I guess you are dealing with uh, most of the Andalusian horses that you are dealing are dressage horses, no? Yes. Most of them. Yes. Yes, they are. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, there's a few. Yeah. Well, there's a few show horses to do uh, yeah. more trick shows where they do uh, rearing up and all the, the high school movements, but that's very rare. But those horses, I understand, they they have a lot of strain on their I like the Capriol and the Corveta and all. Yeah, 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 that's, that's different. Mm. Okay, good, good. But maybe very, very the horses. Yeah. That's why I wanted to, uh, that's why I wanted to say about the arena, uh, yeah. because uh, it's, it's very, very important. And that's most the that they get is because they don't have the right amount of, right type of footing, I'd say. Yeah, it will, it will come, but it's true that in the, like in, in countries like Hungary or Holland or Belgium, they know very well. And like 100% of the places, they, they have a very good arenas and all that in order to prevent lesions. Because also, I don't know, maybe it's amazing because we here in Spain, we have the culture of the horse. There's many other things. I don't know, it's because I don't know, in Holland, Belgium, maybe there's a big industry. Horses are very, very expensive and all that. They, they, they <laughs> in my opinion, they are a little bit, um, you know, like forward them from us, they are a little bit more advanced in some of the things, but we are getting there. I mm -hmm. think we are getting no, there. I think, I think just in the, in the last, uh, I've been doing this horse selling here from Spain the last 10 years. And uh, from, if you look at from when I, when I started and now it's advancing very rapidly. These last three years I've seen, or last five years maybe, Okay. I've seen a lot of much better uh, conditions to keep the horses and to train the horses for sure. Yeah, yeah. And the, you, I think the clue is the education and the, you know, promoting, I don't know, you are also, I think we are friends on Facebook and we are doing a lot of education and, and also for clients or for everyone, webinars about 
teaching things, you know, with all the very good professionals from all over Spain, all over the world, talking about many things, different things related with horses, nutrition, uh, rehabilitation, exercises, uh, I don't know, ultrasound, whatever. No? I think, you know, knowledge and education is, is super important. It, I, I know, and, and I think maybe in Spain, um, the reason why it's not come here so quickly uh, could perhaps be also um, because it's more, the horse is really, really part of the culture. So you've got That's this true. strong um, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years back, this strong right. horse culture, this is how it's been done. And, and you know, yes. Uh, to change traditions that, are very difficult take... to change. Yeah, yeah. It's very difficult to change traditions. It's true. Mm. It's, it's absolutely. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It takes it takes generations to go through it. So that's when I go to stables and I see that mm, they might never never picked up the hoofs on the horse. So yeah. rather than saying you know <clears throat> uh, if you don't do this. Uh, yeah. The horse will get really sick and they, they won't listen to me. But if I say, uh, you know, if you don't do this, you won't sell the horse. But then, then, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a good way, you know, you Nobody, need to make them interested in doing it. <clears throat> it's true. You, I agree with you. And especially in some parts of the Spain, people is living, is very proud and they don't want to change or to recognize that maybe there is another option or another way to do things in a different way. I don't know. I mean, of course, I respect uh, many traditions are right and all that, but we also have to keep an eye what the neighbor is doing, what the other countries are doing, and, and we need to improve because, you know, many but, other people are, can do things better than us. Yeah, yeah. but you know, I, you know, here we have so much knowledge, especially when it comes to training and, and doing yeah. that with the horses. There's so many good, good riders and people that really really know and it's almost like it's the cradle of of the, the dressage the spanish horses this the trained spanish horses it was here yeah. where they came from yeah. so yeah, i think we shouldn't talk down on that actually because i think that there, there's so much knowledge here in this country that you can't sure, sure. yeah but the other the other thing is also i mean of course i agree with you but the the problem is also that is a knowledge that is not open it's like they mm -hmm. keep it closed. They don't. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> they don't have to share. So that, <laughs> that's also, you know, because well, also talking about, for example, dressage and all that, you will never. And, and I think this is like generally speaking, all over the world. But the, you know, the riders, they, they will explain to you how they ride and what is the, uh, you know, the strategy and all that is like really close. So mm -hmm. it's sometimes it's very difficult to make a plan, prevention, whatever, because they don't, because it's like, you know, if you're a very good rider, then it could be, it's like fantastic, and, and then you are very famous, you earn a lot of money, whatever, but there is not like um, riding a school in a way of everything is open and, and all the knowledge is open for everyone. So I think, I don't know, I think it, it should change a little bit in that way. Yeah, I think, well, well, you know, I think that the world is changing at the moment. I think that we're going to open a lot of more avenues uh, for these kind of things. Knowledge will... Yeah, in an, yeah, I think it's very important. Otherwise, I think we, we will be in a very bad situation. We, we, we need to reinvent ourselves to do many other things and all that. And of course, learn from the other people. Just talking about me, I always go every two years, I spend one month or three weeks in a different hospital all over the world, different parts of the world. And I always, I always learn a lot. Mm. You know, you never have to think that you are the best or you know everything because it's not true. I always uh, learn many other things from many other people. And especially these people that they, yeah. If, for example, in Ghent University, they get to do 1,600 searches a year. <laughs> yeah. 1,600, it's amazing. <laughs> we do in Cordoba close to, uh, I think, 260 or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Nothing to well, do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. So this is no, that's, that's, I think that's enough. But knowledge for sure. It's like Socrates, he said, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. That's so right. That, mm. that's it. <laughs> so, okay. 
Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. I really enjoyed our talk. <laughs> I will. I, I, I might call you back for another <laughs> subject soon. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Anytime. Thank you. See you. See you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.